Okay, thank you very much. First, an announcement for those who are here. All right. So where are we and what do we want to do with this, uh, this course? So, okay, here is again the notes. So you can uh, follow everything on the PDF from here. Matt's brief AC UK slash MB13434 LPP. What we're doing here is we're looking at the stationary model. So on the vertical boundary, we have exponential row weights. On the horizontal boundary, we have exponential one minus row rates. In the bulk, we have exponential one, and everything is fully independent. These are the weights. We're looking at a point Mn, and we want to find out the last passage time from the origin to that point. So this is the origin. And we figure that eventually the, last, the longest path will exit one of the axes. So if we stick on the axis for a while, the axis has a fatter strawberries than the bulk. So if you stay on the axis for a while, either this axis or the, or the other one, it will eventually uh, exit the boundary into the bulk and will optimize the whole path to be the, the longest possible. Okay, and the weight collected on the path, we denoted that by u, u of x, if you go up to x on the, on the, on, on, sorry, on the boundary, the weight collected on the boundary, the convention was that positive x means you go on the horizontal boundary for a while and negative x meant you go on the vertical boundary for a while. You collect some weight there and then that's, that's what ux is. As soon as you exited the boundary somewhere, then you start collecting weight in the bulk and that's what we denoted by a, you optimize that. So as soon as you exit it here, you still optimize in which way you're gonna go. That's, that's what the a was. And uh, the, obviously the longest path is the optimum of the boundary weights plus the bulk weights. So it's the maximum of ux plus ax. x could be positive, then you exit here, or negative, then you exit there. And almost truly there is a unique maximizer here because no two paths have the same weights. It's a continuous weight distribution, almost surely. And this maximizer is, is called z. So that's the exit point of the longest path, okay? And the lemma we're proving is that the variance of the last passage time is n over rho square minus m over one minus rho square plus two over one minus rho times the expected weight collected uh, on the positive axis, which could be zero if you actually exit on the vertical one. So the expected weight collected on the horizontal axis. It's also equal to m over one minus rho square plus n over rho square plus two over rho times the expected weight collected on the vertical axis if you happen to exit there. If you exit on the horizontal axis, then this is zero, okay? Uh, that's what we are proving. And in order to prove this, we introduce these auxiliary psi variables on the south boundary, <coughs> which is just a constant multiple of the omegas. And the constant is such that it makes exponential one minus lambda is, uh, out of exponential one minus rho, which we had before. But it's just a constant factor. Lambda will be a bit larger than rho by epsilon. And therefore, everything which has these modified weights will be denoted by a superscript epsilon. So you have a new south boundary. It's just a constant multiple of the old south boundary. You have a new north boundary as well, because the last passage times might be modified by this increase of the south. And you have possibly a new exit point, z epsilon, which could be equal to z or could be larger than z. It could not be smaller than z, because what you do here is just grow the strawberries fatter on the south axis. If you exit it here before, and now you have better strawberries here, then you're not gonna exit sooner. Okay, so Z epsilon is at least as large as that. All right? That's the setup, and uh, we started to prove this. Uh, the first step was to write up that the last passage time to this corner can be written up as the sum of the west boundary and the north boundary, but also the sum of the south and the east boundary. If you write this up carefully and you do some covariance uh, identities and use independence uh, as we saw before in the lemmas, then you end up with the variance of G equals variance of west minus variance of north plus twice covariance of south and north. These are trivial. This is the difficult part. So we saw that. The second step we did was modifying a little bit the south boundary weights uh, and doing some magic with the gamma density and these derivatives. We figured out that the expected north boundary, if you differentiate that with respect to epsilon, epsilon equals to zero, will give you back the covariance of north and south. So this covariance here can be on one hand written like that. And on the other hand, we're going to write this in terms of the exit point, the weight 
collected by the exit, so the weight collected on the, on the axis, and that's what's going to prove the lemma. Okay, so the plan is to finish this proof in step three is to revisit this quantity and try to write it in terms of the exit, the, the weight on the axis. That's, that's what's coming now. Okay, so the north boundary might change, but actually it will change if you increase south. Okay, you're gonna see more increments on the north if you increase south. There are two reasons for that, two possible reasons. One is that Okay, the west boundary is unchanged, of course, and not touching the west boundary. It's just the fixed exponential row weights. If you increase the south boundary and you happen to exit on the south, then you will immediately collect more weight until this old exit point. That's one reason why G will increase, and that implies that the north boundary will increase. Another possible reason is that you might actually exit later. So not only you <laughs> collect more weight here, but you might actually go further to the right on the boundary in this new setup than before, and that might also increase the, the north boundary. Okay, so these are the two options or two effects. And so that's what we started to write up here. So this is what I want to, want to look at here. Okay, now if the exit point doesn't change, then the only change you can see in the north boundary is the effect of the increased south boundary until the unchanged exit point. So therefore, in this case, in this case, north epsilon minus north is just going to be the new, the new weight collected by the exit point minus the old weight collected by the exit point. Okay, so if the exit point doesn't change, then the only change in the last was fish time and therefore the the uh, north boundary is just the increase on the south weight until that point. Okay, and because that epsilon is the same as that, it, it doesn't matter if I put that epsilon here or that is the same exit point. Okay, and for the rest, I'm just copy the previous line in this third step. Okay, so that was my first step. The second step is very simple. I just want to write this indicator as one minus the other indicator. So I'm gonna just have that term u epsilon minus u without any indicator. And then I'm gonna put, so that's one, and then I need to do a minus. And the minus is here. So minus u epsilon z and minus minus u z times the indicator they are not equal. Okay, so let's just put a one minus. This is one minus the other indicator and we'll have some terms. Okay, so I'm now going to look at these terms separately. This one is simple because I have my Z fixed and the construction was, if you remember, or if you see at the yellow, the construction was that the south boundary is simply a constant multiple of the old south boundary. So the epsilon south boundary is just a constant multiple. So this is easy. This I can just write the following way. So u z epsilon minus u z. First of all, if that happens to be negative, what does it mean to, for that to be negative? If Z is negative, that means I exit on the vertical boundary. In that case, the, the new boundary doesn't play any role. The longest pass goes up. If the exit point is unchanged and I change something on the south boundary, it doesn't, doesn't give any role. So if Z positive is zero, meaning I'm exiting on the upper, on the, on the vertical boundary, then I just no contribution. Okay, so this is zero when Z positive is zero. So I can just put Z positive here. And then according to the yellow stuff, uh, this guy is just uh, one minus rho over one minus lambda times the old guy. So one minus rho over one minus lambda, lambda is rho plus epsilon. And I have a minus one here times u z plus. Okay, so if you want, you can write this as a common denominator, one minus rho minus epsilon, and then one minus rho minus one plus rho plus epsilon. It just gives you an epsilon up here, u z plus. Okay, so let's just uh, 
keep it like this. And this is the U Z plus that at the end of the day will appear in that formula. Okay, so that's how it comes in. But then I have this other term. So let's concentrate on the other term a little bit. Let's concentrate on the other term a little bit. Now, couple of observations here. The, so so let's, let's look at this term there. Couple of observations. The first observation is that Norse in the modified thing minus in the original thing is at most the total, the total modification of the weights. I added in some more weights on the sounds boundary. That's all I did. My total last passage time cannot be larger, not change more than the thing I added in. Okay, so north minus north epsilon minus north can at, at most be as large as s epsilon minus s. Okay, I'm adding in some extra weights. That's all I do. Then the total cannot change more than that. All right, and another observation is I already told you that z epsilon is bigger than or equal to z. Well, not only this, but also u epsilon of z epsilon is bigger than u epsilon, uh, sorry, than u of z. That's the other thing, okay? Uh, because, because I exiting more to the right and I have more weights altogether, I cannot be smaller. So using all these, I'm gonna look at the, this term here under an expectation. So expectation of north epsilon minus north minus uz epsilon plus uz under the indicator that uh, z epsilon is not z is bounded by is bounded by so the first difference I bound by s epsilon minus s. This second difference, so, so u epsilon, um, well, okay. Sorry, u epsilon of z epsilon, this is true, but it's even true without the epsilon. Sorry, I want this without the epsilon. If I fix the exit point, the sounds boundary is still heavier there. So it's also true without the epsilon. That's what I want to use because I want to apply it on this term here. This just tells me that that second bit is negative or at least non-positive. So I'm just going to forget about it. This thing here together with the minus sign is non-positive. I just forget about it. And add the indicator in. And now I'm going to just bound everything by uh, Cauchy Schwarz and get an upper bound of a square root of the expectation of S epsilon minus S squared. So the square is inside the expectation, the square root is outside, times the square root of the probability that these guys are not equal. Okay. Uh, what's the aim of this whole calculation? So this is gonna be the term I, I will care about. And I want to show that the second term, all of this board is just error. At least error in this order when I want to do the derivative of n epsilon in the expectation. Uh, notice that I already have the difference of n epsilon minus n. I want to take an expectation divided by epsilon take the limit. In that limit, I want to show that this board here is just an error. So I want a good bound on this and this term showing that it's less than epsilon. At least little low of epsilon. Okay, that's, that's the aim. Uh, shall I proceed that way or is it too, too shiny? Can you guys see this? Okay, I'm gonna move back to the other side then. So let me remind myself to stop here. Okay, everybody remembers this, we we'll need it. And so the first term of course is easy because the sound boundary is just the sum of IID exponentials 
the epsilon south boundary is a constant multiple of that, and that constant has uh, one plus epsilon in it. So when I do the difference, it's really easy. Uh, expectation of s epsilon minus s square under the square root is if you just work out the constant factor is just coming out straight because it's squared and square rooted. And you just have expectation of the old quantity. And this thing here is something it's, it's you know, it's uh, proportional to M, but it doesn't depend on epsilon. So this thing is big O of epsilon. It's epsilon times something. So that's easy. The probability we have to work a little bit more for. So let's work about showing that the probability has also some positive power of epsilon in it, in which case we're done because it's gonna be big O of epsilon times some more epsilons. So that's what we want, okay? Right, so that will require a little bit of work. So first notice, so for the probability, that Z epsilon is not Z. Again, notice that Z epsilon cannot be smaller than Z. So it's the same as it's strictly bigger. It can never be smaller. So for this one, we need to work a little bit. First notice that the exit point, I'll just erase that. The exit point is the unique maximizer of the longest path. So for any K that's not the exit point, I can only do worse than for the exit point in the following sense. If I want to take AZ plus UZ, that is the last passage time, the optimal last passage time. So the weight collected in the bulk plus the weight collected on the axis, that has to be at strictly bigger than if I exit anywhere else. Exiting anywhere else is suboptimal. It's not gonna give me the longest path, okay? So that's for every K that's not the almost truly. Okay, now let me just start now a chain of equalities with events. So let's start a chain of equalities with events. Namely the event that Z epsilon is not Z. What does that mean? Well, that means that there is a more optimal exit point for the epsilon last passage pass. Okay, so that means that for some k, uh, if I now look at the exit point and I want to go to the modified model, and you might notice that I have an epsilon here, I'm going to erase that in a second because I actually don't need the epsilon if you want to that, but I come back to this. So in the modified model, the exit point is different from the original model. So there exists some K, there exists some K, which of course cannot be bigger than M. There exists some K so that in the epsilon model, exiting there is better than exiting at Z, okay? That's what it means that for the modified model, the exit point is different. There is a better pass, all right? Also, this better pass must be on the right of Z. There must be a better pass on the right of Z as well. So it's gonna be strictly bigger than Z. Is that step okay? So that's what it means that the exit point changed. There must be a better exit in the epsilon model on the right of the original exit point, all right? Now I'm going to erase, actually I don't need this. Why don't I need this epsilon here? You can tell me. Why don't I need that epsilon there? Because the bulk rates are not changed. This is just how to optimize the path from Z to the last passage uh, corner to MN in the bulk. And in the bulk, I've not changed any of the weights. I just said the I the exponentials. So A does not care about epsilon. I don't need this epsilon, it's the same A as before, so I don't need that. All right, now, everything I do here is almost sure, right? Let me not keep writing almost sure. The next thing I want to do is add this thing in. And so 
is the same event as, well, up to zero measure sets, that AZ plus U epsilon Z smaller than AK plus U epsilon K. So far, I just copied, again, I don't need this epsilon here. I just copied this line, but then AK plus U epsilon K, uh, right, okay, just let's keep it like that for this moment. And also I'm gonna, uh, write it this one in. So AK plus UK is smaller than AZ plus UZ. So all I did, I was just adding in, um, I was just adding in that observation that we didn't do anything else, just copied in for that particular K, I copied in the observation on the left. Okay, let's rearrange this a little bit. Yeah. If there is any question at any point, just let me know. Let's rearrange this a little bit. So I want to solve these inequalities, both of them for, for the quantity AZ, AZ minus AK. AZ minus AK. So what can I say about AZ minus AK? Let's uh, start here. AZ minus AK is bigger than UK minus UZ from this one. Okay, just rearranging the second inequality. UK minus UZ. That was the second one. And from the first one, um, AZ minus AK. So this is the point where I'm using that I really don't need the epsilon on the A's. Is the same bulk weights everywhere. So these inequalities, these, these are about different models, but they have the same AKs. I don't need to bother with the epsilon. So I'm gonna solve for the same A, uh, Z minus AK from the first inequality. And that tells me that AZ minus AK is smaller than UK epsilon minus UZ epsilon. Uh, for some k, for some k, that's bigger than z. Okay, so I just really just rearrange everything here. All right, and this is this implies that, and I want to get rid of z. Z is a random variable. Whenever I, I'm going to do union bounds in a second, I don't like random variables in union bounds. So I'm going to say that, okay, that implies that there must be some index, which I called Z before, for which this is true. So I'm going to say that UK minus UI, instead of Z, I'm going to use I here, less than AI minus AK, again, instead of Z, I have I, UK epsilon, minus u i epsilon again changing this to i for some i less than k less than or equal to i okay so there exists some index for which this is true that index actually is z but i don't care i just i just need some index all right so now i can easily apply a union bound there are these are just events so i'm going to start talking about probabilities now and for probabilities i can do a union bound so i started with that event there probability of z epsilon not z is therefore smaller than or equal to the probability of the union of these events for i and k in this set and this union probability of the union I bound by the sum of the probabilities. So it's more than or equal to the sum of some i smaller than k and the probability that I have that inequality. So uk minus ui less than ai minus ak less than uk epsilon minus ui of some probability of that, okay? 
Any questions? All right. Okay, so let's look at one of these things here. I have a sum of these probabilities, but this I'm fixing them for the moment. So it's a finite sum of such probabilities. I'm gonna show that each of these probabilities is order epsilon. And then I'm, then I'm gonna be fine. So what is that probability? Probability UK minus UI less than AI minus AK less than UK epsilon minus UI epsilon. What is this probability? I'm gonna condition on the A's. So I'm gonna look at the boundaries and I'm gonna condition on the A's. And as soon as I condition on the A's, I'm in good shape because I know everything about the U's. So this is the expectation of the conditional probability of the same thing, UK minus UI less than AI minus AK less than UK epsilon minus UI epsilon conditioned on the AIs on all the, I could say AI minus AK if you want, or just all the AI, it doesn't really matter. And then an expectation of that conditional probability. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna say that I honestly don't care what these AIs are. I'm gonna bound this probability, this conditional probability from above by the worst possible value of these A's. So I'm gonna say that this is definitely smaller than or equal to the supremum of positive axes. Now, I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. UK minus UI, smaller X, smaller UK epsilon minus UI epsilon. So who can tell me what, what I used here? First of all, why do I look at positive axes? Why do I look at positive axes? We should have? Rate. Yes, we should have positive rates. Yes, that's a, that's a good explanation. Yes, that's, that's true. There is another way of looking at it. And that's that K is bigger than I. So I want the bulk weights from I, which is left of K. Left of K means longer pass to the corner. So this is bigger than that. So this guy is actually positive. So that's why I look at positive axis. What else did I use here? I used one more thing. Yes, but there is one more thing that's important. When I drop this conditional, I also use independence. I use that the U's are independent of the A's. Okay? So it's not the conditional distribution of U's, it's the overall distribution of the U's because they're independent of the A's. All right? These are the two things I used here. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, let's solve this for the U's. Now the first thing, okay, so, so at this moment I know everything, right? The U's are just IIDs. The U epsilons are just constant multiples of the U's. So I know everything at this point. And so the first thing is just get rid of this epsilon by plugging in what I know, namely this is a constant multiple of that. That's how I constructed the whole thing. So this, is equal to the soup of the probability that UK minus UI less than X less than. So the epsilon version is just one minus rho over one minus lambda times the non epsilon version. So one minus rho over one minus lambda, which is rho plus epsilon times UK minus UI which I'm gonna solve for UK minus UI. Oops. Probability. So if you solve this, you find that uh, UK minus UI on one hand is less than X. On the other hand is bigger than X over X times the reciprocal of this other stuff. So X times the reciprocal of this which is a one minus rho downstairs and one minus rho minus epsilon. Okay, let me just put it this way. Uh, that's what I want. But actually, this is really close to one. So this is really one minus epsilon over one minus rho. 
And that's the main thing because you're looking at a fixed number of exponentials at the dot. So K is on the right of I. You have K minus I many exponentials added up in this one, parameter rho. Uh, that's a gamma distribution. And you want this to be between X and one minus epsilon X. You want this to be in, a, in an interval of length epsilon times some constant. What's the probability that this continuous gamma distribution is in a length epsilon interval is proportional to epsilon, it's order epsilon, all right? So that's why this whole probability is again big O of epsilon. And this is uniformly true in X because the gamma has a bounded density. Okay. So that's how you show that uh, this thing is little O of epsilon. And let's see if I still have stuff. I think I already erased, erased that bit from the board. Anyway, the probability that Z epsilon is not Z is now big O of epsilon. We had the square root of that. So that was big O of square root of epsilon. And we had the other term, which was big O of epsilon together is big O of epsilon to the three half. And therefore all of that second term, which I told you is an error is indeed an error. All of that second term is big O of epsilon to the three half. Okay. So it's already not on the board, but, but, but I hope you, you still remember or have it in the notes that second term expectation of that second term is big O of epsilon to the smaller than big O epsilon to the three half. So when you divide by epsilon, take epsilon to zero, it doesn't play a role. Yes. No, no, of course not. I just need little of. Uh, yes. Yes, you're right. That's all I need. Yes. That this thing, this probability goes to zero with the epsilon goes to zero. Yeah. Um, so yes, that's, that's because all the weights are continuous. That the probability that you're just on the verge of jumping is zero. In fact, you're right, you're right, yes. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I thought this was interesting somewhat, I hope. No, I think it's okay. Yeah, but you're right. It's uh, I'm actually proving a bit more than I, than what I need. All right. So that's the end of this lemma. So if you now put together everything that we did, I leave that as a homework. So put in everything we did, and I don't want to repeat all of these formulas. Put in everything we did for step one, step two, step three. So we started with the variance of G. We ended up with that covariance of North and South. That covariance of North and South was equal to the derivative of the expectation of North uh, Epsilon at Epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so you plug that in. That expectation was computed by all of this stuff we did here. If you put together all these estimates we just did, that exactly calculates the expectation of North Epsilon minus North. If you put all these together, you'll get the lemma. You get the first line of dilemma. The second line is similar working on the vertical axis. I'm not gonna do that. Okay. So that's the end of that lemma. Any question on this one? Okay. So let me recall that that lemma was one of the KPC scaling relations. It, it told you that the, um, Second, the, the square of the last passage fluctuation is the same as the first uh, moment of the pass fluctuation in some sense, in this exit point sense. So that was one of these two scaling uh, relations for KPZ. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is from now on, so, so that's the end of mathematics for this course. From now on, it's gonna be hand waving, okay? What I'm gonna do from now on is a sketch of the proof of the upper bound in the KPZ order. So what comes now, 3.3, .3, is sketch 
or the proof that the limb soup of the variance of G and N in a particular direction, in the characteristic directions, so I'm gonna make this a little bit more precise in a second, over uh, say M absolute value to the um, two third is uh, bounded. So this is as M N goes off to infinity, it's important to say that in the characteristic direction, in the stationary last passage model with parameter rho and the characteristics corresponds to the parameter rho. So that's what I want to sketch now. I'm not gonna do all of it because it's too long, but I think, I hope I can show you the, the main steps of the proofs and get some feeling of, of how it comes together. And of course, this lemma we proved will be an essential part of it. Right, now, what's going to happen is we're going to concentrate on the exit point. More precisely, the weight collected to the exit point. This will be the central of that. So just a very, very kind of sketchy version of the proof. We first saw that the expectation of this positive part is the same as the variance of the last passage time. We're gonna do some tricks so that the variance of the last passage time will somehow come back to a deviation estimate of this very same quantity. And in that moment, we have some kind of a loop that the deviation estimate on this quantity is bounded by the variance of the last passage time, which is bounded by or connected to the expectation of the exit point positive part, which is the same object. And that kind of closes a loop. And along this loop, we'll have some constants which eventually prove the right scaling. So that's what's gonna happen now. Again, I'm gonna be sketchy because I don't have time to do anything, but I hope I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the end of, of this. So again, the main reference I'm using is still uh, our paper with Eric Kator and Timo Seppelainen. from 2006. And we were at that time building on uh, Eric Cutter and Pete Grunebun's paper from the same year that was done on the Hammersley process. Uh, that's the main reference I'm doing. Again, there is this improvement, a very si significant improvement by Emra, Georgiou and Ortman from last year who were uh, improving a lot of this, these arguments. <laughs> okay, now it's gonna be sketchy. So first of all, uh, I'm not gonna deal with integer parts. Okay, so I'm not gonna follow the integer parts. I'm just gonna say, you know, everything is an integer, I don't care. And as a first instance of that, I'm gonna define one minus rho square times T and rho square of T times T as two integer variables, even though rho is continuous and t is continuous. So I'm gonna think of these as integers. Everything, everything I do is, is done properly and rigorously in, in our paper. So it all can be done, but let me not waste time on these details. Now, t is a parameter. It's not really time, but almost like time. So as you, as you grow the interface, t will go further and further. And notice that this is exactly the characteristic direction. So I'm looking at last passage times to further and further corners M N that go off along a line of exactly the characteristic slope. That's that's what's parameterized here by T. Okay, so that's that's the first observation. Right. Now the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to almost use the same set up as there, but this time I'm also going to touch the west boundary. So not only the south boundary is multiplied by a constant, but also the west boundary. So I'm gonna introduce here as well, psi zero j's that are going to be rho over lambda times the omega zero j's. The omegas were IID exponential rows. 
So these guys are going to be exponential lambdas. So these things are exponential lambda. And this way in yellow, I am actually getting a fully stationary Laspasich model with parameter lambda. And the way I get this is I multiply the horizon, the, the, the uh, south boundaries by this constant one minus rho, one minus lambda, which makes it bigger. And the west boundaries by rho over lambda, which makes it smaller. So these guys are actually smaller than the omegas. Okay, so it's a, it's not, it's a worse a strawberry out there. Okay, and the bulk rates are the same. Right, uh, I'm not gonna do epsilon anymore. So I'm just gonna use lambda for the new model. I'm not going to do epsilons, but I'm gonna do lambdas for this part. So I'm gonna have GM and lambda in the new model, and I'm gonna have G and N in the old model with rho. So everything here is lambda. Okay, that's, that's the notation and that's the setup. And then let me show you the main points of the, of the argument. And I hope I get to the end of it in the remaining time. Okay. Now, I told you that uh, the new model, the yellow model with parameters lambda is a perfectly fine stationary model, right? It has the exponential lambda boundaries here, the exponential one minus lambda there. It's perfectly fine. The only non-fine thing is the location of the corner. That's what makes a difference between rho and lambda, the rho model and the lambda model. The corner empty is a characteristic for rho, but it's not characteristic for lambda. So the box is not right for lambda. It's not the right characteristic box, right? It is right for low. Okay, now let me start again a little bit of calculation. So again, uh, pretty similar arguments as before. G of lambda T is optimizes the past with the uh, lambda weights, okay? It optimizes the path with the lambda weights and therefore U of lambda, uh, right, let's call it, um, hmm. let me use X. In the notes, I use Z, but my Z on the board looks very similar to capital Z, and that I don't want. So let me use X here. So U lambda of X plus A T of X is less than or equal G lambda of T. And notice that T is just sending for these parameters. So instead of writing MN all the time, I'm just gonna write T. So G T is really, this and G lambda T is really that. So it's the last passage time from the corner, from the origin to this point here. That's what GT is. And similarly, AXT is the last passage time in the bulk only when I exit at point X to this corner MT and T. Is that, is that okay? Right. So that's the longest possible pass I can have in lambda for every fixed X. Every fixed X on the boundary, if I exit there, I can only do as, as good as the optimal pass. That's, what, that's what's here. That's my first step. Okay, so let's start again an estimate on Z. It's gonna be a little bit of a similar argument at the beginning than the lemma. So let's start a, an event, looking at an event that the exit point in the row model, if I don't have an index, then it's the row model. So the exit point in the row model is bigger than some u. What does that mean? That means that there is a pass on the right of u that's better than the pass at u, okay? So there exists some exit point x that's bigger than u 
such that ux plus ax is equal to the optimal last plus each time for the row process. Everything is in the row process at the moment. Okay. That implies that implies that there exists a z, oh, sorry, x bigger than u, strictly bigger than u, such that. So now I'm going to I'm going to plug in uh, a x from here. This a x I'm going to plug in there. Okay. This AX is, okay, I write first and then you'll see it's true. So UX plus G lambda of T minus UF of lambda is bigger than GT. Okay. So what happened here is that AX is less than or equal than G lambda minus U lambda. And so G lambda minus lambda is bigger than or equal than AX. If I put that in there, then I get this inequality. So all that happened is I was just putting, plugging in this star. Is that okay? Right? Which is the same as there exists some X bigger than U, such that just rearranging this a little bit u uh, x of lambda minus u x is smaller than or equal than uh, g lambda minus g t. All that happened is I was moving the this on the right hand side and that on the left hand side. Okay. Now I claim that u x lambda minus u x can only be bigger than u u lambda minus u u. This guy here is bigger than or equal, uh, sorry, smaller than or equal. This is smaller than or equal than u lambda u minus u u. Why is that? Because I'm looking at an exit point on the right hand side. So the difference of the, of the weights collected on the, on the horizontal boundary is just a constant multiple, a positive constant multiple of the original weights between any two points. So if I go to the right of U, then I'm collecting less of this positive difference than if I go all the way to the left to U. Okay, so collecting, um, Sorry, am I doing this right? No, 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 I'm doing this wrong, exactly wrong. Sorry, I'm doing this wrong. The weight from zero to X is bigger than the weight from zero to U, that's what I want to do. The weight from zero to X is bigger than the weight from zero to U, and this is just a constant multiple of UX, a positive constant multiple, that's what I want to do, okay? So if this one was smaller, then this one is also smaller. So this is a subset of, even that there exists an X. Well, I don't really need X anymore, right? It's a subset of just U lambda U minus U U smaller than or equal to G lambda minus G T. Okay, simply because this guy is bigger than that guy. So if that was smaller, then this is also smaller. Okay. So now comes the, the interesting bit. So this is, the, this is really the, the important uh, kind of event I want to look at. So this event bounds, or it contains the event that I have this deviation for the exit point. And what coming, what's next is I want to center these things. I want to, these are not centered random variables. I want to subtract the, the, the means of all of these random variables. So the notation will be notation x tilde for any random variable x tilde is going to be x minus e x. Okay, that's that's my centering. 
And so I'm going to center this inequality in the following way. This is equal to, so let's write u u lambda centered minus u u centered, smaller than or equal to g lambda centered minus g lambda uh, minus g centered. That means that I subtracted some means on the left hand side. So I have to subtract them on the right hand side as well. So mean of EU lambda minus UU. And then I subtracted some means on the right hand side. So I have to add those back. So I'm going to add back here. Uh, add back. Now this is adding back because I have another minus here. So minus minus is plus. I'm adding back the mean of G lambda and I'm subtracting by that minus G of T. So that's what I get when I center my quantities over there. Okay, is this okay so far? Right, now these quantities are difficult, right? They, they depend on each other and, and they're difficult, but their means are very easy in the stationary model. I can compute all these means easily. So let's just do that. Let's just compute these means. So expectation of this difference, u u lambda minus u u minus c lambda plus c. What is that? Again, I'm not gonna bother with integer parts. You can do that, but I'm not gonna do that. So what is that? So this guy is the south boundary from zero to u. I the exponential one minus lambda. The mean of that is u over one minus lambda. Okay. The next guy is the south boundary in parameter one minus rho, u over one minus rho. The next guy is still easy because lambda is now a stationary model. So at this point, I'm using that I have a full stationary model. What is the mean of the last passage time of the stationary model? You can go south and then east and you're adding up IID exponential increments. Of course, this is not independent of that, but the mean is still fine. So this we did before, you end up with the position M, the position M, which is what? The position M is already gone, but it's gonna be M time of one minus rho square times T, that was M. That's the characteristic position M over one minus lambda. That's how much you go to the right for G lambda. And this is the weights on the right boundary. Then you go on up on the east boundary. The height you go up is rho square T, which is the characteristic position of the corner. And all of those weights are exponential lambda. So this thing here together with the minus is giving you the, uh, the minus G lambda, okay? Plus the same for rho. So the characteristic position is one minus rho square T on the horizontal. The uh, parameters are exponential one minus rho. On the vertical, I go down, go up rho square T and I have rho. That's gonna be plus G T. So this is my, uh, this is my expectation, okay? Now just one more step quickly. I can actually cancel in the, in the row model, I can cancel one of these rows and then I get one minus rho t plus rho t, that's just a one t. So I have a t here. I have a u over one minus rho. That's uh, this term here. And then I have these one minus lambda terms. So one minus rho square T minus U over one minus lambda. And I have a minus rho square T over lambda. So these are just uh, this guy, that guy and that guy together. And that's just the form of, of the expectation. Now, so far what I did was true for any lambda bigger than rho. So I didn't say, but I think I use that lambda is bigger than rho. 
other than that I have no restriction. Now I want my bounds to be as strong as possible. So I want, I started bounding this events and I want this event was a subset of, of these events and I want to make this event as small as possible in some sense. The way to do that is to make this expectation as large as possible because then this inequality will be sharper. I want to make this event large. So the idea is to let's make this, let's make this as large as possible by picking lambda. That's the, that's the, that's the idea. So lambda is completely arbitrary. At this point, I'm free to pick lambda other than it has to be bigger than rho. Let's pick this lambda in a way that's optimizing, that's making this uh, expectation as large as possible. And it's clearly, clearly okay. Uh, U is gonna be smaller than, so U is gonna be smaller than one minus rho squared T, so that this term is positive. In fact, later on, I think I'm gonna make it smaller than three fourths of that. You need to handle the other case. So you need to handle what happens when you is bigger than that. I'm not gonna do it here. That's not the main thing. You can do that. It's not very important. So I'm gonna assume from now on that I have that, then this is positive. This is also positive. They both have a minus sign in front of them. Clearly, if lambda gets very close to one, then this blows up in the negative direction. If lambda gets close to zero, it blows up in the negative direction. So I will have a maximum. It's a meaningful thing to maximize this in lambda. And if I do that, I'm not gonna show you all the details. If I do that, you end up with, so that ends up with lambda equals to uh, rho over rho plus square root of one minus rho uh, square minus u over t. That's the optimal choice of lambda. Homework, do it. Okay. You can easily check that this is indeed bigger than lambda, uh, bigger than rho. So things work okay. Right? And you can actually plug this back, this lambda back in the expectation. So with this choice, with this choice, Again, uh, after some calculations, if you plug this thing back in here, you end up with expectation of u u lambda minus u u minus g lambda t plus g t ends up being uh, the following two rho one minus rho t times times one minus one half, one over one minus rho square of u over t and minus square root of one minus one over one minus rho square u over t. That's one way of writing what you get. Again, it's a little bit of algebra. You end up with this, this thing, okay? Any questions so far? So what's the main idea? What, what, what are we really doing here and, and what, what is going on? <laughs> it's gonna turn out that we don't see that yet, but at the end of the day, the interesting bit will be when u is little o of t. Okay, so u will be much smaller than t, which means u over t will be a small number. And actually what you see here is the constant and linear Taylor expansion of this square root. So the, way, the way this is written now is that you exactly have at u equals to zero, you get one, that's one. That's gonna be the linear term for the Taylor expansion. And so when you subtract your original function, you end up with the quadratic term in Taylor, okay? Again, that's something you can do. You can, <clears throat> you can work out the details. Essentially, it's a Taylor expansion, although for square roots, I always like to square things more, but, but you can do that as well. You can do Taylor. 
you convince yourself that you essentially end up with the square of this stuff as the error term after subtracting the constant and the linear stuff in Taylor. You end up with the square of this stuff multiplied with this front. So the main point is that you get u square over t square times t. And that's going to be some constant which works out to be rho over 4 1 minus rho cube times u square over t square times t. So that's just the u square over t at the end. Okay, so this is the optimization uh, step. All right, that's the sharpest thing you can do in, in, a, in, in this kind of approximation, in the second order approximation. That's the sharpest thing you can do for this inequality here. That's the strongest you can make this stuff by optimizing lambda. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. Right. So let's go back then to our calculations. So Z T bigger than U is therefore going to be the following event. So U tilde lambda of U. I'm just copying from somewhere there from the bottom line. U tilde lambda U minus U tilde U smaller than or equal than G tilde lambda t minus g tilde t and then i'm going to plug in this expectation so this expectation is at least that large with my choice of lambda and that makes that inequality at least this sharp as what i'm going to write so bigger than or equal than or oh, sorry smaller than or equal than g tilde minus g tilde over rho minus rho over four one minus rho cube and then u square over t. So just plugging in that expectation over there. And now I'm going to split this into two bits, union bounds. This is smaller than or equal to. So there are two choices. Either u tilde minus u tilde is small enough, or if not, then g tilde minus g tilde minus g is large enough. So either the u's are small or the g's are large. And I'm going to split this in half. So I'm going to say that either u tilde u minus u tilde, uh, u tilde lambda u minus u tilde u is smaller than minus half of this rho over 8, 1 minus rho cube and u square over t. Either this happens or, or g tilde lambda minus gt is larger than positive of rho over eight, one minus rho cube, u square over t. If none of these events happens, if u is larger than that and the g is smaller than that at the same time, that will violate my inequality. Does it make sense? This is a probabilistic splitting. I'll leave you one minute to digest this. Okay. So this inequality means that either u tilde is small enough or g tilde is large enough, at least one of the two. And that means this or that. You could of course split in other ratios, but that's that's what I did. Okay. So Let's proceed with both of these events. So now I'm going to apply a probability, of course. So I'm going to do the probability that uh, let's do one of those. Let's do the first one, the U. So what's the probability that the U tilde minus U tilde is less than minus this stuff here. Notice that we're talking about centered random variables. So these are both deviation events. Everything is centered, everything is mean zero. These are all deviation events. Okay, I'm going to apply a Chebyshev on this. 
smaller than or equal to the variance of u lambda minus u uh, times the reciprocal of all that stuff squared. So 64, one minus rho six uh, t square over u force and the rho square. That's just a simple tradition. And this is the point where, of course, when you have this exponential stuff, which we saw in the practice class, that makes this one, for example, much stronger. But here we just do a tradition. Okay, now again, I'm not gonna do all the calculations. This is something you can do because you know everything. These are just, uh, so u lambda is a constant multiple of u u. u u is the sum of i the exponentials. You know how to calculate this variance. You can do all of this. You, at some point you simplify stuff a little bit and you end up with one minus rho to the four t square over u cube, okay? It's kind of natural that somehow one u is lost because if, um, if u is very small, that means lambda is very close to rho. When you look at the, what, what the optimal lambda was, if u is very small, then lambda is very small, close to, to rho, and that makes this very small. That's why you're losing one of the four powers and you end up with a third power here, okay? So that's the first step. So that takes care of one of those probabilities. The other probability is with the G tilde. Okay, so again, on the other one, on the G tilde, I'm gonna apply a Chebyshev. But of course, it's much, uh, it's a different story because I don't know the variance of G tilde. That, that's what I'm really after. So I can't do an explicit calculation there, but I can still say that the probability of G tilde lambda minus g tilde bigger than rho over eight, one minus rho cube and u square over t. That's exactly the other event I had somewhere over there. This is bounded by the variance of g lambda minus g. And again, I have to divide by all this stuff squared. So 64, one minus rho six, t square over u cores. Okay, so that's the, that's the other bound I have. And uh, I had a union there, so I apply a union bound means that the sum of these two bounds will bound my original event. Sorry? Uh, yes, I forgot the rules there. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Now here comes a step which I'm not gonna tell you much about. There was this homework that the variance, the variance of a sum is always bounded by twice the sum of the variances, even if the things are co uh, correlated. Okay. So this one you can bound by variance of twice variance of G lambda plus twice variance of G. And then there comes something which I'm not gonna tell you how to do, but using that lemma which relates the variance of G lambda to the exit point, to the bar weight connected on the exit point, you can actually make, a, you can actually show that this guy is not too far from that guy. You can show that they are not very far in the order we need. So you can bound that difference. I'm not gonna do that here, but what ends up after some steps, which I'm not doing here, is that this thing is really close in some sense to that thing. It's not that far, okay? Again, some gaps, but I don't have time to do everything which means that there is gonna be some constant, namely all that stuff and yeah, all that stuff, variance of GT, then you're gonna have this T square over U force and you're gonna have some error term, which error term comes from the close two arguments. Okay, again, I can't show you all the details, but that's what you have here. And that gives you, according to the 
lemma we proved last time and today, half of the half of the of the time, the variance of G actually moves over to the expectation of the exit point. The variance of G is the expectation of U of Z plus. Last error. And of course, very important, sorry, very important that you have the you have the t square over u4. Now you wonder if you go back to that lemma, you wonder that we had some other stuff uh, in front of the exit point expectation, right? We had some row squares and uh, over or m, and we had some other stuff there. If you plug in the characteristic direction, all that previous stuff exactly cancels out. On the characteristic direction, that's the only thing that remains from the variance of G. Okay, so that's why that's how this works. Okay. So let's collect everything. And I'm almost done, which is good because I don't have much time. Probability that Z plus Z bigger than U is, of course, the same for a positive U. That the probability that z plus is bigger than u, right? This is smaller than or equal to the sum of these two terms. So that term and this term, according to what we just did. So this is smaller than or equal to constant times t square over u cube. That this one, this is what I call constant. I don't care about the actual constant. They just have rows in them and numbers. And another constant times expectation of u z plus times t square over u4 plus some error, which you have to believe me that it's not relevant. Okay, so this is just combining this bound and that bound. They add together after a union bound on this event. That's still okay. And so here's my claim that, well, okay, first claim is that the exit point being larger than U or the weight collected to this exit point being larger than something is really almost the same stuff. The weight collected until the exit point is just the sum of high ID random variables. So you have large deviation estimates, you have all kind of stuff to available to you to make sure that this thing is really almost the same as the probability that the weight until the exit point is bigger than some number, okay? So this is really the same stuff, except for some very small error that comes from large deviation estimates, simply because this thing is the sum of that many IID exponentials, okay? So you can easily transfer this into that. And that gives you a bound, like a constant times t square over, well, I had u before, now I just changed scale from the location of the exit point to the expectation of the path. There is probably a factor of one over one minus rho in between the two. So I'm going to use y instead of u. And constant times expectation of u z plus times t square over y4 plus error. Okay, so this is again the same line as before. I just moved from location of the exit point to wait until the exit point. And in between the two, there is just a large deviation principle for the sum of IID exponentials. So it's almost the same. Now, at this moment, I hope that you're seeing the loop I have the tail probability for u z plus, and I have the expectation of u z plus in the same, same uh, inequality. And this inequality has the two third in it. I'm gonna show you how to get the two third power out of this. It's two lines. Abbreviation. Abbreviation, I'm just gonna write expectation as E, just 
So spare a little bit of writing. And also I'm gonna write a new integration or new variable, yet another one, y over this e. So what do I have? What is this inequality then telling me? It tells me that um, if I start writing the expectation of u plus, expectation of u z plus, is equal to the tail in the, the integral of the tail probability. We have seen this today in the, in the other lecture. In fact, we saw this for second moments. I'm only using it for first moments. So to get the expectation of anything more negative, you can integrate the tail probability. Okay. So I'm going to change variables and I'm going to write it's the E times the integral from zero to infinity, the probability that u of z plus is bigger than y, which is ev. And I have a dy, I have a dy, which is just, which is just dv times uh, e, and that's why I have this e in front, okay? So this dy is e times dv, okay? which is, I'm going to split this into two parts. I'm going to say that I first look at the integral from half to infinity. Same thing, probability u z plus is bigger than ev and dv. Plus, from zero to half, I just say it's a probability. It cannot be larger than one. From zero to half, is just going to be bounded by e times one half. Okay. All right. So now I can go. I can plug in my inequality, which I worked for in the last three lectures. So this is smaller than or equal to e integrate from half to infinity. Put in the estimate for the tail probability. Put in this line. Constant, constant times t square over y cube. So t square over y cube. But what is my y? This is my y. So e cube, v cube. And then dv. Plus constant E integrates from half to infinity. Uh, and then what do I have here? This is just E, so just an E. And my bound is E square over Y force. T square over Y force, but what is my Y? My Y is EV, E force, V force dv, okay, plus error, plus this half e. So I was just simply plugging in my, my stuff there, right? And what do I have on the right hand side? So I have a one over e square. I have some constant. I have some integral from half to infinity of, uh, and I have a T square, I have a T square. I have an integral from half to infinity of DV over V cube. I have an other T square over E square and another integral of one over V fourth. Right? And I have the error and I have the e half. Move the e half on the other side. This is my left hand side and I'm done in one minute. Sorry for the overtime. Move the e half on the other side. E half is less than or equal to T square over E half, uh, sorry, T square over E square times some constants, times some finite integrals. This is whatever, I don't care. I, I could integrate it, but I don't care, it's a constant. 
plus an error. And that's it. Rearrange E cube is smaller than T square. E is T to the two third. Okay, so E is bounded by T to the two third. And times constant. And of course, E was, E was the expectation of the exit weight, which was equal to the variance of G by that lemma we proved in the beginning of the, of the, of the class. So I have that the variance of G is less than T to E two. And that's it, thank you very much. Any questions? The order of the error? Uh, I believe myself that it's okay. It, I mean, you can trace it down from the paper. Uh, there are a couple of things which I didn't know. For example, what happens when U is bigger than um, from constant times T? As you see here, uh, the, relevant, the relevant scale of U, since the expectation of U plus is T to the two third, the relevant scale of U is also T to the two third. That's where the interesting things happen. When U is much bigger than that, you handle this as kind of a deviation event, and you can just do some crude estimates there. And that's where these error terms come from. Uh, I, can't, I wouldn't be able to tell you right now, but you can trace it down and it's, it's, it's real. There's also some integer files. If you don't have any boundaries, then right. Um, I can't tell you right now, sorry. I'm not prepared for that. I can't tell you, but uh, I think from this, you can get, an, an, as far as I remember, an upper bound on the variance. Not sure if you can get the roller bound from this. Uh, sorry, I can't tell you at the, at the moment. Sorry. We can we can check on the in the paper. So the question was if somebody missed it, uh, what happens if you don't have the stationary boundary, just the bar? So you you treat the boundary as exponential one as well everywhere. It's not stationary. You can get some estimates on the variance there from, from this argument, but I, I forgot the details. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>